Hey there, welcome to the Eurostep, a Milwaukee Bucks podcast, proudly a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network and the Eurostep Podcast Network. I am one of your hosts, Ty Windish. I am joined, as always, by the flustered with technology, Rohan Kadi. There was a lights mishap before we started, but now everything seems to be all good. Rohan, how's it going? You know, I'm doing much better now that my lights are seeming to work. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see uh, my little background light. Subscribe to the YouTube, by the way. Uh, just There were a couple of them that were just not agreeing with me, but this color, they all seem to work, but we're all good. We're ready to, we're ready to do this. We are, and we've got a different kind of, well, partially a different kind of episode today. We're going to kind of just run through a year, a look back at the year in review that 2021 was for the Bucks and for us here at the Eurostep and now GSPN. Uh, it's been a hell of a year. Some ups and downs, certainly, and a whole lot of different senses that we'll get into, but we're excited to do that. And then, of course, talk a little bit about the current state of the Bucks. I think the way our, the Eurostep, our podcast within GSPN is described is Maybe the too granular look at the Bucks, too passionate for what we're actually talking about. So we're going to get into the Dante Wes Grayson trio and how that's playing out and some other stuff that's going on. But Rohan, excited to, to look back at the year, especially because I don't know if people remember this. The Bucks won a championship. They did. They did win a championship indeed, but that's not what started the year off. I thought you were going to run through some plugs. I wasn't ready to go. Right oh, I, I can I can run through some plugs let's before go, we get into it. <laughs> before we get every, into this. everything. Yeah, we did earn this. Make sure you're subscribed on your podcast platform of choice. Make sure you leave a five-star rating on both Apple and Spotify. On Apple, you can re leave a review as well. We'll read out a review at the end of this episode. Make sure you're subscribed to the Substack, gspn.substack.com. I already mentioned the YouTube, Eurostep Podcast Network on YouTube. Follow all the Twitter accounts. I think that's that's all the plugs. I think that covers it. I, I didn't say we earned it. I said that the listeners have to earn the rest of the content by helping us out. It really does help. All of those things. Just It's all free. Not, we don't have anything paid right now. So just throwing us a follow, a subscribe, a review, whatever it is. We really do appreciate it. Okay. Let's talk about 2021. The year started with the Bucks beating the Bulls by 30 on New Year's Day. Although, similarly to their start to the 2021-22 season, more on that later, they were underachieving at 3-3 three and three at that point. The first real low point of that year, or maybe just the lowest low point of that year, was in February as the Bucks lost back-to-back -back games to the Raptors. Rohan, we decided Chris Middleton didn't deserve an all-star nod for the season. That was tough. It, it was tough, but at the end of the day, that lessons were learned. And, you know, I think I don't really walk back that take. I don't think you do either. No, um, it, was, but, it was accurate. Yeah. It was correct. And it was deserved. It was deserved. And that was just a culmination of the Bucks' regular season. And that was their worst regular season in the Mike Budenholzer era. They finished third in the East after finishing first in the last two seasons. And they entered the playoffs in a matchup that a lot of people were really worried about the Bucs. They were like, are they going to be a first round exit against the Miami Heat? Because if you recall, in the bubble the previous season, they lost to them in five games. But this team was up to the challenge. They did not tank to get out of that spot. And, you know, after a slog of a first 48 minutes, ending with a Chris Middleton game winner, which is fitting considering what we just talked about. Bryn Forbes and the Bucks just absolutely destroyed the Miami Heat and swept them back to fantasizing about the aforementioned bubble. The Bucks' most fearsome opponent, the only one who could ultimately push them to seven games in the playoffs, awaited in the Brooklyn Nets in the second round. The series started awful. Milwaukee's first win in Game 3 after starting 0-2 wasn't much better, at the time at least. It broke you, Rohan, one of the all-time meltdown pods and to be clear that that wasn't just you i think a lot of people were broken at that point um, it was tremendous content though it was absolutely you're learning for me now um at the time it seemed like why bother even winning obviously in retrospect thank goodness they pulled it out after Giannis had his worst game in the postseason in game two 
and caught hell on Twitter for it and other places. Giannis turned a corner in this series as a player, as uh, his his whole trajectory changed. He took steps toward becoming the finals MVP version of himself that would obviously come in a couple series from then. Kevin Durant loomed large in a lot of ways all series, but could not overcome the combined might of the Bucks, including a legendary Giannis 40-piece in Game 7 on the road, plus Brooke Lopez just dominating on both ends that series. The Nets were done, and only the Hawks stood between the Bucks and the Finals. Like you just said, only the Hawks stood between the Bucks and the Finals, and that's because the Philadelphia 76ers managed to throw away their entire franchise <laughs> and lose a game seven on their own court. I, I love uh, that this is a Bucks year in review and we found a way to slander the Sixers who the Bucks for so- somehow did not meet in the playoffs. Odd the way that worked. Yeah, just really odd. Imagine if like a certain player just took a shot over Trey Young. Wild times. Maybe the last, the last uh, uh, moment for that player as a Philadelphia 76er, we shall see. But it was the Hawks who indeed were facing the Bucks in the Eastern Conference Finals. And like I mentioned, a lot of people were surprised to see them there, but uh, they should not have been underestimated as they were, as the Milwaukee Bucks lost game one at home to those Atlanta Hawks. And let me, let me not forget that that is the one home game that Ty Windish attended <laughs> during the postseason for the Milwaukee Bucks. I'm going Only home game, loss. I'm going to a game in January. And I've been told by Las Vegas, I'm not allowed to disclose which one because it would swing betting markets too much for that game. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if they can not lose like they did against the Hawks. Yeah, we'll see if the Ty Windish curse is real or not. Or maybe it's only safe for the postseason. We shall see. But uh, <laughs> the Bucks did indeed bounce back. They took a 2-1 lead and uh, they were rolling. Uh, they were trying to make it 3-1. They were, they were down in that game four, but they were coming they were trying to make a comeback and then just the world stopped for Bucks fans. Giannis's knee uh, looked like an elbow uh, for a sec there, just uh, bending the absolute wrong way as he went up for a rebound. And uh, yeah, that we, we thought that was it. We did a post game pod. I believe it was you, me and Jordan who did that one. And it just seemed like what, what, what's happening here. The Bucks ended up losing the game, but obviously the most important fact in our mind was is, is Giannis going to play basketball in the next year or so? We just assumed it was just a, we just assumed the worst. We did not think it was going to be some injury that he could come back from. Uh, but uh, we, we ended up, we ended up hearing news, uh, I believe two or three days later, maybe two days later. No, I think it was the next day, actually, that he was doubtful. We had our famous doubtful pod where we were just screaming doubtful, doubtful. back and forth, <laughs> back and forth at each other. We we're just confused because it's like, oh, my God, this guy, this guy, can he's actually might come back. He's not going to be out for a year. He might be playing the next game. He ended up not playing the rest of that series, but the Bucks ended up winning that series. Chris Middleton, Drew Holiday, and Brooke Lopez took it home for them. And uh, it was just, uh, it seemed like, it seemed like it was time for the Milwaukee Bucks to shine in that series. It really did. And I think what always will stick out to me was PJ Tucker after the game four loss, just refusing to accept that the Bucks would go down like that. And that's what happened. They didn't go down like that. Giannis ends up okay, which, you know, they didn't somehow, somehow, He's okay. Even more implausibly, the Bucks win two straight playoff games without Giannis Antetokounmpo. But Brook Lopez again can't give enough shout out to Brook Lopez. Get well soon. The Bucks win games five and six on the July fourth weekend. I was so sunburned watching Game Six. I was miserable. But I have no idea what that's like. I, it's, trust me, it's not good. <laughs> But they booked their ticket to the NBA Finals the first time in nearly five decades. It has been, had been, I should say, a full full five decades since they won. But Giannis or no Giannis, the Bucks found ways to get it done. And only one more team stood between them and that elusive championship. And that team was the Phoenix Suns after, uh, after beating the, uh, the Clippers in the conference finals. Uh, they managed to get to the NBA finals 
And uh, it was it was sort of a weird uh, atmosphere before game one. Obviously, the Bucks, like I mentioned, they didn't have a great regular season, so they did not have home court. It was a road game in Phoenix game one. And it's just like, is, is Giannis going to play? Is he going to play? There was a lot of noise about like, oh, he would have rejoined the team in the Atlanta series if they didn't think that uh, the team had it under control, but they ended up winning without him. So he didn't need to come back. Uh, it was like, if that series went to a game seven, would Giannis have been there? I don't know. So it was a lot of stuff up in the air for Giannis's status in game one, but he did end up playing game one of those NBA finals. Uh, he started things off. He had like an insane chase down block that Jeff Van Gundy on the air called LeBron, LeBron-esque. And it's like, what, what is, what is going on right now? This man, like just absolutely destroyed all ligaments in his knee like a week ago. Uh, but uh, that was, that was one of the only highlights. He wasn't Giannis in his full form. He had 20 points, but which is still incredible given his status, but uh, the Bucks ended up losing that game. And uh, they ended up losing game two as well. Even though Giannis started to find his footing, he was absolutely unstoppable. He had 42 in game two. And it was just a lot of like, are the Bucs going to be able to figure this out? Devin Booker and Chris Paul were absolutely torching the Bucs in the pick and roll. They were uh, roasting Bucs bigs. What's going to happen? They were roasting the scheme, I should say. They are roasting the scheme, not the bigs. So it was all, uh, all the noise turned to Mike Budenholzer and this team as they went back to Milwaukee. Uh, and what they were going to do. And they really took advantage of that homestand. They realized Ty Windish was not in the building, so they decided to win game three and four. And so it all came down realistically to game five. Game five, back in Phoenix, is when Milwaukee's finals run went from incredible to downright legendary and truly historic, even more than a typical finals run. The big three, Giannis, Chris, Drew, had rarely all played well simultaneously in the playoffs. It was almost a running joke, maybe a laugh through the tears kind of running joke. But all three of them went off in game five, combining for 88 points. And two of those 88 points punctuated one of the greatest plays in Bucks NBA history, honestly. As Drew Holiday wrestled the ball away from Devin Booker as he drove, brought it down the court, and instead of running down the court, waiting to get fouled, decided to an attempt to attempt an audacious lob to Giannis. As my favorite part of the play, Chris Middleton behind the both of them, just pointing upward, signaling for the oop. No one could see him, but Chris knew it too. Giannis finished what would become the true value oop and stared down the camera right after, letting everybody watching know what Bucks fans had figured out a long time ago. Giannis is that guy, pal. He definitely was that guy. And uh, game six really, really etched that into uh, the history books here. As back in Milwaukee, the Bucks were up 3-2 in the series after being down 2-0. They had won three in a row. It's back in Milwaukee. Bucks in six is just written in the stars. It wants to happen. But uh, it, it was a struggle. Phoenix was keeping it keeping it real close. Both teams just looked absolutely gassed. They couldn't make a shot to save their lives and neither team would, neither team could, but thankfully Milwaukee, they, they have a guy that doesn't need to really shoot to, uh, to uh, get his, uh, get his points, get his scoring load, make an impact on the game. And that is Giannis Adetokounmpo. Like I mentioned, he was transcendent in his best NBA moment, not 51, not 49, but 50. 50 points to absolutely will the Milwaukee Bucks to their first championship in over 50 years. The Bucks one and six with Brandon Jennings sitting courtside and just absolutely destroyed every single stupid narrative that hung over them from whatever fan base, whatever media outlet you want to say. It was all gone. Giannis put up 50 as the Bucks won a title. It was just absolute bliss. There was just so much perfect about the championship run and I don't know if I'll ever get over it quite honestly but unfortunately this being the NBA calendar in COVID times there wasn't that much time for celebrating before more basketball stuff was happening Chris and Drew boarded a jet to Tokyo right away after the victory parade where you and I Rohan met for the first time by the way and recorded yes. a just giddy 
not Josh Giddy, but the Emotion Giddy podcast uh, in front of Pfizer. One of the cooler podcast moments of my life, for sure. Um, really, really, really fun stuff. But joining up with Devin Booker, who they had just vanquished in the Olympics. Chris didn't get to play that much on Team USA, but Drew ended up earning a starting spot and was one of the best two or three players on that Team USA as the Americans won gold and proved some of their detractors, myself included, wrong out in Tokyo. Yeah, that was that was the times when we were picking our Olympic teams and you all just absolutely roasted me for my team. Harrison <laughs> Barnes, my, baby. He's having a good year, he though. Would, he is. He's having a good year. I think my take is uh, aging quite well, honestly. But uh, one decision that is not aging quite well is something that happened during the offseason, which was the next sort of stage for this Bucks team. As uh, after the Olympics concluded, uh, it was a lot of free agency. They managed to keep Bobby Portis. They signed Shemi Ojale uh, to, right after we concluded our live stream. Uh, and uh, they decided to not pay P.J. Tucker. And like I said, that decision has not aged well thus far as uh, they're learning that Shemi is not, uh, he's not P.J., to put it lightly. They also acquired Grayson Allen for just nothing. Uh, realistically, plus they drafted Sandra Mamakalashvili and Yorgos Kalatsaikis in the draft. One of those players is still on the team. Uh, they added Rodney Hood, the aforementioned Shemi Ojale. George Hill came back, which is a nice moment. Uh, and that was that was a lot of the mainstays of what happened in the early stages of free agency. Yeah, and it looked like, even though most of those players weren't playing game one, it looked like another John Horst masterclass. It looked like an everything masterclass as the Bucks destroyed the Nets on ring night, even with many of those new players sitting out, plus Bobby Portis and um, just felt like everyone was out for most of the season thus far. But because of that, the year quickly soured, at least the early part of the year from there. Brooke Lopez hurt his back in that first game and suffered a something and has not played since after eventually undergoing back surgery. At one point, the Bucks were 6-8. and eight. Basically, everyone has missed sometimes. Some of these games, the Bucks' rotation has been largely unrecognizable. Yeah, it's just been uh, it's been a lot of guys coming in and out of the lineup, nothing consistently. And the problem is that a lot of the guys that they brought in haven't looked really rotation caliber. Uh, I mentioned uh, Yorgos is not on the team anymore because John Horst has been active. He realized that... Uh, you know, we got to make some moves here. We got to get some more rotation guys in. So they bring in a guy like Wesley Matthews. They add DeMarcus Cousins. And especially Wes so far out of the two, though DeMarcus is starting to make a run, they look really, really good. And really good considering how low our expectations were for both of them. Uh, I know DeMarcus, he just came off the bench uh, after starting five games in a row. Wes Matthews has been hitting big three after big three and just uh, – just shooting those arrows into the sky. And uh, it's just been, it's been good so far. Everyone's sort of starting to come back. Everyone's turned a corner. Only Brooke Lopez is out now uh, for the team. He's the only guy in the injury report, which is great. We even got Dante back, uh, which has been nice to see so far. And it, the big three is just continuing to dominate games. They're just winning most of the games that they play together. Only two losses on the year compared to 16 wins, I believe. Uh, so those two, uh, those three, excuse me, are just, they're all that we know them to be as we have just chronicled throughout this entire run. And, uh, I'll know I'll, I'll knock on wood right now. I'll knock on my desk. Things look good. Things look good right now, Ty. It, it still feels hard to believe just through all that Bucks fans have really any amount of any length of time have been through. It does feel like just it's been an overall good year for the Bucks, but We've been here chronicling the highs and the lows through it all this year and longer than that, actually. But starting in May, it wasn't just us here on this feed, on this platform, as we merged with the Win in Six podcast to become the Eurostep Podcast Network. We've added YouTube, we've added Substack content, more Twitter accounts, playback watch parties, and we've grown our Discord server really just to make sure everybody can keep up with all the stuff we're doing here as we cover the Milwaukee Bucks. Yeah, it's just been an incredible year for us, just like the Bucks. There's so much, so many more of you tuning in now than there were at the start of the year. And uh, even though Milwaukee's uh, title run might be uh, a, a big reason why 
we are we are eternally grateful just in general to have so many fantastic listeners in fact there are enough to uh, there are enough of you to fill up Pfizer a few times over which is just absolutely incredible and really humbling to it's just it, it blows my mind it i think it blows all, everyone's mind who makes content but especially us here as we look over some of the year-end numbers so really i think the one thing left to say is thank you to you all listeners watchers readers everything else for making 2021 so fantastic for us and honestly we look forward to an even better year for gspn and somehow for the bucks it's going to be tough to top but I think they can do it in 2022. I mean, I just feel like a, as a content creator who and a Bucks fan who really just wants to share in these moments, being able to share what we're thinking and, and honestly, probably mostly feeling for the two of us, but thinking too, the real analysis in there amidst the, uh, the more raw, visceral, emotional stuff, being able to share it with so many great like-minded Bucks fans and not always like-minded there's some great debates and everything as well but it's just been really really cool and really gratifying and i can't think of a better way to watch milwaukee win a championship than with the gspn community that we're growing here so whether you've been around since the eurostep first started or you just joined you know around the championship either way we're thrilled to have you and seriously it means the world to us that all of you folks follow along yeah, it, it really does mean the world. Like you and I, Ty, we were talking before we started recording about uh, our first podcast episode that we did together. And uh, it was a game, it was the season opener against the Rockets back in uh, October of 2019. And I remember just one take from that podcast being like, why is Wes Matthews keep posting up? And then it's like, I see this game, I see the Christmas Day game. It's like, man, that Wes Matthews post up really helped the Bucks win the game. <laughs> and it's just, it's such, it, it's coming full circle. It's, it's starting to really grow. And that's why I, I just want to feel grateful. It's just, this is a wild concept to me. Like I mentioned, I've been doing this uh, with you, Ty, since October of 2019. It's, it still doesn't really feel real. Like I'm someone who really does not take compliments well. I'm someone who does not like, I, I feel like I suffer from imposter syndrome when I'm doing this. It's sort of like, how, how is this really possible? There's so many people listening to me just to absolutely, well, one, lose my mind over the <laughs> Milwaukee Bucks as documented after the game three win in the Brooklyn series. But just listen to me talk about basketball. Listen to us talk about basketball. It's, it's wild. It's absolutely nothing I could have ever imagined something I would do with my life as I was sort of growing up and continue to grow up. Everyone keeps growing still. It's just, it's, it's really humbling. It's really humbling. And just wanted to say thank you everyone for a great year and to many years going forward. Cheers to that. And I could not ask for a better partner in crime to yell uh -huh. about the Milwaukee Bucks with than you, Rohan. So Same to you, Ty. Now that we got that stuff out of the way, let's get to what the people really want film breakdown of the Bucks nearly blowing a lead to the Orlando Magic with 10 players out on Tuesday night. No, we're not going to dive deep into that game because we are, we're not that crazy. But let's talk a little bit just about the team in general now, as we do here on the Eurostep. Our last pod of 2021, as you probably figured out by the whole year in review thing we just did. Honestly, I like, I'm just really encouraged, despite two really bad halves in the last two games, the second half against Orlando and the first half against Boston. We're getting a look at a different Bucks team now with Dante and West coming off the bench with Boogie still there with the starters now getting more healthy outside of Brook, of course. And I think we're seeing like there's a good chance that some guys who have been in the rotation will get pushed out. Some already did based on Thursday's game against Orlando. But it's a good thing because there's just so much competition. We talked about it before the year. We were kind of wrong then. A lot of the players we were excited about haven't worked out. But because of the midseason additions, one of which kind of just being Dante, this team is like feels ludicrously deep right now compared to Bucks teams in the past and just the other teams around the league that you're sizing up against. Can you look up and down this roster and name me 
two players that are absolute complete liabilities? On the roster, yes, but who will actually play games? No. No, I'm t- on the roster. Who on the roster? I, I can guess the two names you're going to say. If, but guessing, are they com- are they complete liabilities, though? Kind of. I'm guessing we're not talking two ways because that's kind of cheating. But probably the two I would say is Thanasis and, and Shemi in no order. Yeah. And they have upside. That's the thing. Exactly. That's the thing I'm trying to say. Yeah. They're not yeah, yeah. complete complete liabilities on either end of the court, which just speaks to what you were just saying about this roster and the roster construction. There's so much depth to this, which is why we're going to get into who's really going to be in the rotation. Like who, how do you really make this run if you're the coaching staff? Also, did you, did you see Josh Oppenheimer's halftime interview? I, I think I had the game muted at that point. So I, I didn't hear what he said. I, I saw him. I don't, I don't remember ever hearing him in a post game interview or a, post halftime interview before guy sounds insane guy sounds absolutely (laughs) insane like he he talks with such a force where it's like do you do you talk normally like (laughs) it's just it was a it was a weird experience but the bucks coaching staff bud and this coaching staff really have a lot to get into so let's really let's let's start by talking about who should really uh who who's come in and how they're coming in and doing it really well and the one uh let's start with wes matthews Let's start with him. He's the guy we got to talk to. I'll talk about in that we year talk review to him we too. just did. Wes, if you're listening, we need to talk to you. <laughs> yes, we do need to talk to you. We do need to talk to you, Wes. Please come on the pod. But it's just, it's insane. What's, what kind of production he's been having. He closed the Christmas Day game and hit essentially the game winner on Christmas Day for this Bucks team after he was sitting on his couch for like five months. Like, I, I don't understand how this happens. Like, is any other team, like, obviously another team would have picked him up with a hardship exception by now, but how does this sort of happen? And how does really Wes Matthews sort of keep doing this? He's still a great defender after all these years in the league. He can still hit his threes. It's just, he he feels timeless. He does. And I think there's a little bit of the George Hill corollary happening here. I think he's going to look extra good because the Bucks just don't need him to do as much. The last, it's the same with George, really. The last time we saw Wes, Wes was actually a starter. George was essentially a starter because you just clearly could not rely on Eric Bledsoe, who's having a, a nice couple last weeks on the Clippers, whatever. They he had 10 steals in a game, didn't he? I'm sure he did. It is, Maybe not uh, 10 steals, but he had a decent watch. number of steals. It is steals. December, so that, that would check out. I don't even mean to take shots. He, he wasn't getting the job done in Milwaukee, clearly. That's all I'll say. I'll move on. But George and West now are like battling to be the eighth man? Maybe? Maybe higher now that Brooke, if Brooke comes back. And actually, I want to touch on this before we go on. Have you heard the latest from Zach Lowe, who's the only one reporting on Brooke Lopez? Outside of Shams, who is just like, Entirely wrong. Although Brandon Brook was wrong, I guess. But did you hear what Zach Lowe said, though? Uh, yeah, he said uh, he said people with the Bucks are maybe have hope that he's coming back well before the end of the regular season. I think it's still. I think he's still putting it as cautious optimism. But that is really exciting. And now I'm kowtowing to Adam McGee. I, I would still do the Kenny Hustle trade, like trading Shemi and War or whatever. I don't really care about that, but. I'm not trading Brooke. I'm not doing any major moves because this team is like, they're just so good and they're so set in stone. I think they could still use another big wing defender. I think Wes is going to do some of that though. Like if Brooke comes back and can look nearly himself by playoffs, this rotation is just insane. Like it's absolutely nuts. Like all of a sudden you're at a place where you're a break glass in case of injury guys who last time were... I don't even know. I mean, Jeff Teague was always in the rotation. It was like the Nasus and I can't even remember. I feel like I'm blacking out on who, who was on the team. Brent Forbes. <laughs> yeah. Like they just like, it was bad. They're 11th and 12th. Guys. Oh, what's the, what's the guy's name? Uh, what's his name? Axel guy who came Tupan over. played. Yeah. Axel Tupan. Uh, the, the other guy that Jordan Israeli correspondent. What's oh, his name? Oh, uh, Elijah Bryant. Yeah, Elijah Bryant. Elijah Bryant, yeah. The Bucks, 11th and 12th guys, if Brooke gets back and they don't make any moves. 
Demarcus Cousins and Rodney Hood, who both have been like good this year. Like, Big Rod. Rod's coming around. He well, hasn't always been good, but as your twelfth guy, that's ridiculous. Like any other Bucks team, I think he's pretty obviously slotting into the top ten somewhere. Right now, he'd be twelfth. So you're talking about an injury that really puts you back, and you're without a guy. Like when you get to the when you get to the nitty gritty of series when you're playing like seven eight guys. Like you're not even worrying about those guys then. Like that's how deep they are. But West and the Mac- important thing, yeah. the important thing is is just the position that they've really stacked up on, is is no position realistically. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot of tweener forward wings who can play guard, and it's just like if someone someone gets injured, one of these guys can fill their spot. You want you want West Matthews to go out there and play the two guard for you? Yeah, sure. He was starting last year for this team at the two. You want him to go out there and be a four? Yeah, he'll do that. Why not? Yeah. Same could be said about Rodney Hood. Same could be said about Jordan Wara. Same could be said about Pat Connison. Same could be said about Thanasis. He could play one through five, actually. He might be the most positionally versatile guy out of them. Probably. It's just, it, there's so much just absolute depth at every position. But yeah, go on about West Well, and, and just to finish that, even Chevy, who's been a disaster, if you need like eight minutes of just someone big being guarded, He's done that this year. Like that as maybe your worst player. He will guard a player. Yes. It's something. (laughs) Do you trust him more than Axel Tupan? No disrespect, but come on. Like they're better. But I don't know. His, his inbounds defense was elite. That is, that (laughs) that, that playoff run was so just out of this world high on something. I don't know what, uh, cream city bricks crushed up. I don't know, but Wes, Wes is timeless. I think that's a word I've used a couple times too because it just looks like the same old Wes, except he's been even better offensively. Probably not going to hold that he's shooting 51% from the field and 45% from three thus far. But just defensively and fit-wise, he's in all the right spots. This whole team really, like, outside of Shemi, who's no longer playing, he just doesn't play anymore. Like, all the guys right now in these last two games – There's just kind of a flow and honestly, even more so in the heavy bench lineups and especially when like the Giannis at the five group that ended the Celtics game, which I believe was Drew, Chris, Giannis, Dante, Wes. I think you're seeing the future of the Bucks with some of these lineups. So just like we have a bunch of wings who can size up or down. We'll switch whatever we need to switch. We probably won't switch Giannis, but if we have to, because it's a great shooter, we will. And we'll just be okay. Like, we have size and strength all over. You still have Pat to slide in. You still have Bobby to slide in. George Hill. They just have so many options. I think Wes, I, I'm a little leery of the shooting. I don't know if that's going to hold. But that's okay. Like, he's still going to be an immensely useful player who provides some gravity, provides some defense. He's in all the right spots. And maybe he wants to just go bananas this year. That works for me. That works for me. If you want to shoot 45% this year, as long as you keep it to the playoffs, that's fine. That sounds like a repeat I mean, to me. <laughs> the Bucks had two guys shoot above 45 last year in Bobby and Bryn. That's so why true. not? Why not? Why I not? mean, right now, like it's a funny looking at the Bucks three-point shooting because Chris is like bottom half. And George Hill has had a <laughs> slow start too. Chris is like 36%. George Hill is like 31%. I couldn't care less. I'm not worried at all. Dante's a little lower now as well. And obviously, it's also a two game sample. Yeah, it's a two game sample for for Dante. And we should talk about him in a second. And Giannis always, always at 27%. But when he makes something fun, but you look at Bobby's keeping it up 43%. Wes, as I mentioned, Pat, 40%. Grayson, 40%. Drew Holiday, 36%. Not bad. Not bad. He was higher in the regular season lower in the postseason Brooks at 50% on four attempts, but there's just a lot of guys you can trust to knock down shots right now. There really is. And uh, just one more, uh, one more point about like the switchability of the lineup that you mentioned in the Christmas day game, like that lineup didn't even have Pat Connaughton in it. Pat Connaughton. I know we said, we're not going to discuss game film about the Orlando manager. Pat Connaughton absolutely had Wendell Carter jr. In jail. Yo, in jail honestly like defended him successfully on multiple possessions made a layup at like 100 miles an hour did you see the layup he made like yeah. 
The, no way. Off an of, off of insane Chris Dime. No way is Pat making that in last year's. Like, he is seriously. I think he should slot into some closing groups. Like, he's really. Do the, do the Bucks have the most bench guys who could be closers in the league? I, they almost have to, right? Like. I mean, because, like, most of their bench guys could be close. Look around the league. Like, how many guys are bringing George Hill, Dante DiVincenzo, Wes Matthews, and Pat Cotterton off the bench? Three, And that sounds that would sound hilarious, like, two years ago. But right now, I mean, these guys all look electric. Like, they're... Would all of those guys be starters on other teams? Maybe not George. Probably not George would be the one. I think the other three, you could probably find a team. They Wes, would Dante, and Pat. Honestly, absolutely. would all four of them start in the Lakers tomorrow? Yes. Like as a, the, a guard to pair with Russ? Like maybe even George. He might. Maybe not George. That's the one who maybe wouldn't. But he, there's honestly a case to be and made. That's honestly, it's just because he's old. Yeah. Like, But I mean, the same argument can be made about Wes Matthews, and he could still start. I, I think the Lakers have to be kicking themselves right now. That they let Wes go. Wes is way better than the old guys they have. They're still thirsting for Trevor Ariza to get back. Trevor Ariza. Wes Matthews is so much better than Trevor Ariza right now in the year of our Lord. Giannis 2021. Soon to be 2022. It's not even close. Like Some of the young guys' development has been interesting here. Especially Dante who... Let's just talk about Dante. The shooting has not even been good. I keep looking at the numbers and thinking they're going to be higher. I've just loved what I've seen. Like, I'm back Same. in love with Dante DiVincenzo. And completely walking back my, he's gone because they signed Grace and Take. Like, I am no longer there. I am no longer even close to there. It's taken two rusty games. But you can see, like, his burst is still there. He got it back. And Which is awesome. an absolute marvel, by the way. This guy has been plagued with foot and just lower extremity injuries like his entire life, and he still looks this bouncy. It's just absolutely insane. It is. And I think even if the shooting is going to continue to be touch and go, which not really fair to judge him on his first two games back in seven months, just the impact, the rebounds, the loose balls, the defense, like – I, I know the whole thing with Grayson was like, they've never really had that offensive spark plug. They can really unlock stuff with the starting five. I don't know if it's just Grayson or what, but we haven't really seen that so far. Like when the big three have been healthy, have been Grayson's worst games. Like he's not finding enough shots to be effective. And as hard as he tries defensively, he's not making a difference on that end. Meanwhile, you plug in Dante like, I just feel like literally, so Grayson's first make against Orlando was a three in the third quarter. I think it was his only make the whole game. And he didn't have one, so he was 0 for 2 through two and a half quarters with two assists, and that was it. Like, just nothing stood out except for that one three. Dante DiVincenzo, it feels like every every minute he's on the floor, he's doing something where I'm like, oh, that really helped the team. Whatever he did, that that was very beneficial. That was a big play. And he's still gambling and missing and costing sometimes, but the big play opportunity is there. And what Just they could look, do- look at the Christmas Day game, yeah. Look, like the combined steal with him and uh, Drew Holiday to pluck Jason Tatum's pocket late in that game as they were trying to take a lead. It's that those are the type of impact plays that we're talking about right now. They are destroying teams in his minutes. They look like an entirely different team. Their average right now through the two games is plus 16.5 with Dante on. Like, they're obliterating teams when Dante DiVincenzo plays. I feel like the energy is just, like, infectious. It's going to the whole group. Like, when he's out there, I feel like everyone is diving and getting loose balls and diving out of bounds to save one sort of fast break. It's like, the it's the Pat Beverly effect. It is. It's kind of like, like a supercharged version of the Pat Condon effect. And I think those two together, like that's such a bench tandem of just sheer athleticism and just stuff happening. I know I've talked about this before on the pod, but the one thing I don't like about bench players is when, or just in general, like a guy can be quietly efficient, but just not do anything for a long time. And I just think there's a limit to how useful you can be. Even if you shoot a high percentage, there's just a limit. It's like the, the reason the Rockets weren't as good in the playoffs is because they had all these guys who 
not due to any fault of their own, but they just really couldn't do anything except stand and wait for James Harden. The Bucks are like the opposite at their best. They're entirely free-flowing, kinetic energy. The ball is zipping all over. I've seen some of the wildest passes. And I think you look at a big reason why is the off-ball motion of Dante and Pat and Bobby and Wes and George Hill, the ultimate connective tissue. Like, everything is zinging, and that's how they need to play. That's what they need to lead into. I know they're going to ISO with the big three to end some games, but their worst runs of the season so far have been when they just like, okay, we're going to post up Giannis six possessions in a row with no passes. Giannis is great. Get Giannis moving. Get all these guys moving. And then they're like, there's no stopping the Bucks. It's what people are just absolutely obsessed with with the Warriors often. Yeah. Like, if that's something, I feel like the Bucks are trying to sort of bridge the gap between just, I don't know, kind of between the Spurs and Warriors, realistically. Honestly, in terms of style, the way they run their franchises, and also in terms of play style, they want to play a beautiful game, uh, which is the Spurs aspect of it. But they also just want to have like full all time read and react, which is the Warriors offense. And which, uh, given a lot of the Warriors' current success is from the old Spurs days, but just sort of that, that gap between electricity and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, electricity and something else. Reliability. What's something that's con- Yes, that's, that's it's perfect. Like a, I wish I would have like thought of that. Tesla mixed with like, a 2006 Toyota. There we go. But not a Prius, like a, a Corolla, a non-hybrid Corolla. To be specific. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, that, that works. It's like, it, it's a flashy versus just reliable. No, that's a great way to put it. And the Bucks are sort of, they're hanging in that middle ground, which is, you know, it can be dangerous at times to hang in the middle because you're not on either side. But I feel like the Bucs are sort of treading that line fairly well so far. And they have been for the past couple of years, honestly. I think, ironically enough, given all the myriad, some accurate criticisms of Mike Budenholzer before the championship, the theme of the team now is versatility. Being able to do either of those. Being able to do all sorts of stuff offensively. being a, Running more defenses than ever. I mean, this is something where if this was last year, we would be doing a pod every week freaking out that they just they just do zone now and they're starting to figure out how to do it well. They switch more. They trap way more. They double. They scram switch. They play some drop, not much without Brooke Lopez, but some with Giannis primarily. Like, they do everything on defense. Like, this would have been a huge buck story. Now this year it's not because I think they already proved they can be more versatile but they're going to have more options than they had last year, which is even better. Like this, like I I just have so many bucks reasons to be excited right now. It almost like I, I I could forgive someone if they thought I was just being like a patsy for the team, but it's just like all the signs are just so positive. Like uh, the things that don't work out are being shoved to the corner. Number 37 and everything else is working out and looking promising for the future. I love the versatility. And that's, I think, even the case. So we joked, maybe not joked, in DM at one point. Is, uh, can we bring back the, is Wes Matthews a starter debate? Because he, he's been making the case. Now Dante comes back. Dante is now Real ones case. remember that. Real, real ones, ones remember, remember that, that for sure. But real ones also may have joined later and missed it. We, we had a lot of debates, Wes versus Dante. Um, during that season, and it was someone else too. Forbes was involved. That was the year after. We've debated the two guard spot for a long. I think time. maybe George Hill. Maybe George Hill as well. Not Pat at yeah. that point in time. That's for sure. No, 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 no. Um, I think it was between Wes, Dante, and George Hill. We're like, oh, should we get a second ball handler on the floor so Eric Bledsoe doesn't have to do all that? It's a valid idea, honestly, but. We talked about that a little bit. Like, there's so many guys you could start as the fourth or fifth starter right now. I mean, there's the Bobby versus Boogie thing, which I think is kind of settled. I think it's going to be Bobby as long as he's healthy, which is good. I think Boogie is a good bench big. I think that's what he does. But honestly, like, and Grayson's been shaky, as we mentioned, as I mentioned. But I think what's going to matter more than who starts, and this is what you said when I asked you about Wes, is who closes. 
And I don't think that's going to be the same for every team. Like, I think stylistically, they're just going to be adaptable. Like, you're going to have Drew Chris Giannis, of course. Even when Brooke is back, after that, like, you could tell me there are 10 different Bucks closing lineups, depending on the matchup. And I would not be shocked. Like, they have so many useful players that they can trust that Bud has trusted. Like, again, Wes Matthews closed the game like a week or two after being signed on Christmas against Boston. Like, they just have options. And I think that's that's the story of this team. They're versatile. They can do all sorts of things well. And that's what makes them extra dangerous. It is what makes them extra dangerous. Do you want to know something fun? Uh, uh, here's, a, here's a fun thought experiment. I don't want to like just rain on anyone's parade right now or uh, rain on the high we've just been on about this team. But isn't something we talked about last year about how they went from guys who can, we were making the joke about John Horst saying, oh, guys, who can shoot dribble pass, going away from that and getting some specialists in there in like Bryn Forbes, PJ Tucker, those sort of guys, Bobby Portis, sort of shifting back to shoot dribble pass guys. Yeah. Well, I think that's that's largely what worked. It is what worked, but I think the important distinction to make, what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to I'm trying to draw the line between those two schools of thought yeah. in the sense that that didn't work previously is because the Bucks weren't really adapting their schemes at all. Now, they can go with a bunch of shoot dribble pass guys because they will adapt their scheme. So it's a bunch of guys who have, sure, they're specialists at different things, but they can all do a lot of different things. Yeah, they're and better. so, yeah, they're <laughs> well, yeah, one, they're, I mean, they're better. <laughs> they didn't really have that many guys who could do all three of those things prior to the I last mean, like, year. no, th- I mean, think about that. It, it's, it's this a lot of the same guys it's Dante, it's George Hill, it's Wes Matthews, it's Pat Connaughton. Sure. Those are the, those are the same players. Well, Pat's like a whole different player. Now. Okay. I, I, I'm trying to say they got better, but okay. I'm also trying to say that scheme plays a lot in. It does. It's scheme and just overall talent. Like also the last time that it was Wes and Dante and Pat all together and, and Hill was pre drew holiday. And I think it really goes to show the difference that sliding guys down on that, like, I always say totem pole for some reason, but like the totem pole of, of role on the team of, of a spot matters so much. Like pyramid. When, how about that? Pyramid works. Yeah. I think pyramid probably even better because some guys are on the same level. So it's like Giannis is up here doing Illuminati and then you get Chris and drew. And then like Brooke is kind of like one big block. And then you have like Bobby and Pat and you can quibble about who's who. But, like, earlier it was, like, Chris, uh, Giannis, Chris, and then Brooke kind of the same-ish, especially in the playoffs. Chris, not the greatest consistent playoff performer before, like, last year in kind of the bubble. And then it was, like, okay, George Hill, you're number four. Wes Matthews, you're number five. Dante, you're number six. Those guys all just push back now. I think they're all better individually. Maybe not Hill. Wes looks better than he's ever looked. Or then he's looked for a long time, not ever, but then for a long time for sure. But I think adding Drew makes such a difference. And like you said, the scheme, not being only drop, having much more cohesive offense to run, figuring this stuff out over all the years and all the heartbreak. It's just culminating. It's all coming together. And the result is like special. Well, he- and it's, it's interesting you say it's all coming together because they already won a title, <laughs> you know? Like, that's that's something that I talked about. I don't know if it was on this podcast or another podcast, or uh, probably both. Uh, in the sense, like, the Milwaukee Bucks are now trying to determine where they stand in history. Are they a bad boys, not a bad boys, but an 04 Pistons sort of team? Or are they a Spurs? Or are they a Warriors are they a heat? Are they a dynasty? They that's, a the, that's really what they're asking themselves right now. And that's what's going to be determined in the next couple of years. Are they a one-off? Are they a Mavs? Are they a 2011 Mavs? Or it's like Dirk gets his one ring. And it's like, yeah, that's awesome. Good job. I'm glad Dirk got one. Or is it, you know, Steph Curry? Just title after title after MVP after MVP. And just keeps on going and going. And they're still contenders now. 
which path are the Milwaukee Bucks going to take? Based on this play so far, I know this is a bold take. Leaning towards the latter. Yeah, leaning toward Giannis being Michael Jordan. Honestly, like one is earlier than Jordan did his first one. Um, a long way to go, of course. But I think it's encouraging. Like there's no evidence of the Bucks doing what the 08 Celtics did. The real true example of a one-time champ and just milking it immediately. Like, do they even talk about it? When's the last time we got a quote about the championship, right? Like, they're so focused on this season, this upcoming playoffs, getting better. And you can see, like, no part of them is resting on their laurels. They went out and got a new starter via trade. They've elevated Bobby Portis's role. They're doing new things schematically on both ends of the floor. They're figuring out lineups. Like, there's no complacency here. And I think it starts with Giannis, as everything in the Bucks does. We know how Giannis is. Giannis is not happy with one. He's, I'm sure, happy to have won. He's not done. And no part of Giannis is done. And the rest of the team goes from there. Chris wants more. But right after they won, said so they had to go get another one. Like, um, John Horace, same deal. Like, we know what they want to do. And talking is one thing. But I think we're seeing the signs that you'd want to see from a team that just won. Like, no part of them seems satisfied. No part of them is like, oh, got that off our backs. We're good now. It's all about, like, the next challenge. And I think that's what you need to be that dynastic kind of team. It's just, like you mentioned, starts and ends with Giannis. A given, a lot of this is going to be like, is Giannis going to play for the Bucks for the entirety of his careers? Yada, yada, yada. We'll cross that bridge when we get there, you know? Just signed a Supermax like a year ago. It's also like, how do, you, how do you build your team? How do you keep doing this? I mentioned the 2011 Mavs. After they won that title, that team got destroyed. Absolutely gutted. Bucks aren't doing that. You mentioned they're not complacent. They're adding new guys constantly. Even throughout the season, we've seen even before they needed to have like hardship exceptions and stuff. Also, what happened to DeLorean? Just a random thought. Is he still on the team? No, they're out of protocol, so he has to be gone. It says he's inactive on the official box score. I think he has to be gone. Maybe I don't think it's 10 keep days. Him for the 10 days. Wild. Okay, regardless. I thought, I thought that you had to, like, the spot's not there. They have everyone out of protocols for now. There was a player for the Magic who got pulled mid game for protocols, but unfortunately, the Bucks have mostly already been through it. So. Not that many guys left to go in, although there are clearly some. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen, obviously. But I, I think the spot would go away, but I'm honestly not sure if that's like an oversight on the scorecard or if he gets to hang out for the next four days and never play or whatever. Uh, yeah, but whatever. I don't know how it got onto that. But they just keep adding guys. They keep just keep on improving this roster. And they're probably not done. We talked about trade targets on a previous podcast. They're probably not done yet. They're probably going to add a few more guys, change change things around at least a little bit, a little bit before the playoffs roll around because we have a long ways to go until then. But this team is good. Just to, just to sum, sum this up, this team is really good. I agree. Also, one more last b-ball question because we just got sidetracked about our Bucks excitement. Are you worried about Grayson Allen? Yes. Me too. I don't love it. It's been, it was a hot start. It really was a great start to the season. But as guys got healthier, it's just, it's just not there. I think my supercharged Tony Snell comp was spot on, honestly, because he's doing a Tony Snell recently. Yeah. When everyone's healthy, he can't find his spots. He can't get what he needs to. And honestly, Maybe I'm not too worried because he hasn't had to have such a big role. And we know, we know through previous games that when he has to, he is more than capable of stepping up. Right now, he doesn't have to. You mentioned that he's not finding his shots. I mean, th those shots are being taken by Bobby Portis, by Chris Middleton, by Drew Holiday, by Giannis. Like, that, that's what should happen. Like, I don't think we want Grayson Allen to take, be taking away shots from those guys. So maybe I'm not worried, actually. I, I think he should be doing more than he's been doing lately. Like three points is not good enough for a starter. And I get he plays with a lot of high usage players. 
he doesn't always play with the other four starters. Like it, there's a rotation. He's in and out. He's just not doing enough. And I think you look at a guy like Dante. Dante got more shots up than Grace did in this game. He played like half the minutes. Like there's more there than he's taking right now. And I, I'm not too worried because like, A, yeah, they can win if Grace Allen doesn't take a lot of shots. It just, I mean, they signed him to a eight figure extension. You would like him to score a little bit more when the good players are healthy, which should be what you expect to see in most games as we go forward here. But B, I, I do think it's still kind of just a fit thing and him figuring out how to fit with those guys. It's fit in, not fit out. It, well, yeah, fit in, not sit out is what is he's his version of it because he is going to end up sitting out at least in the starting lineup if he's just not doing anything. But I do think like it's the Wara problem of Jordan Wara looks so much better when he plays with the other G League guys because he gets to take 20 shots a game and he knows how to do that. But I think Grayson has more time spent as an auxiliary player. I think he'll figure it out. I'm not that worried yet, but I do think he's going to start feeling some pressure soon. If Dante can start knocking down his shots, if Wes continues to play well, I don't think that starting spot or a, a big rotation spot are guaranteed. He's kind of already lost closing games. Like that's not happening anymore. We know Bud. Bud loves defense. Like the way Grayson has, has played offensively, he's just not closing games right now. We'll see if the starting spot changes. I think it's possible. I think he's got to start figuring out faster how to fit in. Because we've seen he has some juice handling the ball. He obviously can knock down shots from the corner. Some of it, the team needs to find him more. I think some of it is on him just needing to do more when he does get the ball as well. Yeah, I've noticed a couple of times where it's just like he gets caught in sort of the flow of the offense sometimes where it's like, oh, pass, pass, ping, ping. And he's just like, okay, he's just going with the motions. He's not doing anything trying to attack. He's not trying to take advantage of missteps by the defense. He's just like going on to the next pass. If it's like, if he gets the ball on the wing after a quick pass, he's going to shoot it right to the next guy. It's like, okay, if your defender's a little locked down, let's attack that. We know you can attack that. And we know that you actually can hit your floaters and hit your layups. Do something. Operate out of the short uh, short roll on occasion. Do what you need to do. Like, go set screens. I don't know if that's a schematic thing. I don't know if that's a Grayson thing. Maybe it's a combination of both. Maybe it's a combination of both in the sense that Grayson, he needs to not be as complacent, but also Bud needs to get him more involved in these sort of actions. Because we've talked at length about, like you mentioned earlier, a lot of the times it's just like, okay, Giannis, go post up. Chris, go size your guy up. Drew, just bully anyone on the court just go do go do that big three you guys are you guys are awesome go do that but it's also like can we can we get grace and allen coming off some pin downs at times can we get like can we get inverted pick and rolls with Giannis and grayson like we did with kyle corver and Bryn forbes can we get those sort of actions involved i it's it's going to be a learning experience like we've mentioned this team is just getting healthy this is a problem that is just starting to arise because they finally have their full team. <laughs> so as they sort of keep going and getting more minutes with all of their guys, then they'll sort of start to make those, those moves, those sort of like, okay, we need to get this guy going because he's not feeling it that much. Okay. Now that Grayson's fine. Okay. Maybe Dante's taking a little bit of a step back. Let's get him, him some action. Getting back to that sort of, rotation of who's hot is playing games that we saw in like the 18 19 season where it's like pat condison's not playing a lot because he's not shooting well oh pat's shooting well you're right back into the rotation pat sorry to whoever it was i don't remember anymore west was out of the rotation. maybe no it was pre-west oh that, that, bud's first year who was that tony snell right was he still on the team yeah i think that's when they stopped playing tony snell or maybe not. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe. It's so, been too long. I do think, like, I see the run more offense for him, and I get it. But you said it earlier. Like, you're not going to run that much offense for Pat – or for, excuse me, for Grayson with the starters. I think a play or two would be good and maybe could get him moving. But I think some of it is he needs to figure out how to move off ball, to put it as Bud did, randomly more. I mean, you look at, like, when Pat or Dante or even Bobby gets hot – how many of those touches are 
either them grabbing their own, like finding an offensive rebound and doing something with it, or relocation, like constantly relocating and finding the right spots. And that's why I think maybe it's just not playing with the big three very much and still getting used to how to move around those guys. But I think like Grayson should be doing, and maybe he is and I'm missing it, but I think he's not fitting as seamlessly there. And that's a bit, that's like the big tenant of the Bucks' offense most of the time. Like they're going to run some plays, but a lot of it is like relocation, off ball screens, like orbiting around Giannis. And I just don't think he's getting to the right spots to draw more looks. He's going to have to work on that. And the Bucks are going to have to work. It's a two way street. It's always a two way street, but uh, I'm not, I'm not shaking in my boots yet, but I obviously am not happy with the way he's played the last couple weeks, however long it's been. You're not, uh, you're not uh, shaking in your boots. You're quivering in your Jordans. Yeah. I'm tiptoeing in my Jordans. <laughs> There's an old that just aged myself. I think. Yes, because I have no idea what like you're 20, talking. It's like 2016. It's not old, old, but it's old. It's what? It's, where is that from? It's a song. It's not just, just. It's not worth going into here. Okay, just I'll figure it out later. I guess that's fine. Uh, I usually I usually learn things, Ty. Come on, you're not teaching me anything. Uh, I don't remember enough. Ah, oh, see that? There it is. There it is. He doesn't even know his own reference. <laughs> so before Post Malone. There was like, uh, like a really greasy version, which I know, like greasier than Post Malone, yes, named Riff Raff, and he had a song called "Tiptoeing in My Jordans," but it's spelled "Tiptoe Wing," in my J A W W D I N Z, and this was a very big thing. It's actually 2014, so I really aged myself by saying. 2016 or whatever I said. That was nearly eight years ago. Yeah, thanks. I was 19, and it was a big deal. I was undisclosed. I was 18, 19, yeah. Undisclosed. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> I'm not that young, everyone. Uh, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't say it this time. I know. I'm, I'm catching myself here. But, uh, but yeah, not, not too worried. Not too worried about Grayson yet. It's sort of like a wait and see sort of thing. Are we here's here's a here's a reference. Are we taking the reading materials? No, but it's not that I'm out Are of the, do the reading materials exist? The reading materials right now say Dante or Wes should maybe be starting. I'm taking those. I'm not taking the Grayson is bad read. I'm shutting those those with Well those go those ha- not th- those, those go hand exist. in hand. No, they don't though. Those go he well, can be I worse mean, than he, another player without being bad. But here's the thing. We know Bud in terms of like his starting style. He does not change his starting lineup. He has at this all. year. Well, he's had to. This but, year. I mean, Boogie started Bobby's first game or two back. Well, yeah, because he was just coming back. So was the honest, he started. I don't know. That feels a little different. It, a little, but you're not starting Jordan Ward to bring Giannis off the bench. I'm sorry, Jason Kidd would. <laughs> oh God, gotcha, the name man. has been uttered. The name has been uttered. Um, but but yeah, like you're the thing is, Grayson. You're, you're, you're not saying do I think uh, uh, the reading materials are should not will. I think the answer to both is maybe, but. I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying. Those. I'm taking those. I'm just. Materials. I'm just saying that Bud is not going to make a change in his starting lineup unless Grayson Allen starts to show decline. Well, we're there. Well, a, a continued trend of yeah. decline. Yeah. And the other guys continue to play well. Yes, but those go hand in hand, is what I'm saying. You can't have Wes and Dante should start. Without having grace in his slipper. Yeah. Yeah, to some extent. But again, it's not it's not that I'm out on Grayson. It's just that he hasn't the, the team hasn't been as good with him as they have with Dante. Yeah, it's, I know, but we could have we could have made the same argument last year for certain stretches when it's like I know I know, like in the playoffs, for instance, like Pat Connaughton was better than PJ Tucker for stretches. It's like, should we, yeah, should we start him? Series. Yeah. 
It's like, should we start him over PJ? It's like, no, they're not going to just start guys because they're playing better than starters. I think it's a little different now as opposed to during the NBA finals though. I know, but this is like, this is something we've seen with Bud throughout his entire tenure in Milwaukee. Yeah, but Bud's not coaching the same way he coached his entire tenure with Milwaukee. I know, but he's not changing everything about himself. No, but I, I, I mean, Dante that was also trend his guy. Constant. Dante was also his guy. And we know Bud loves defense. I don't think True. it's out of the realm of probability that... By... I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. I'm just saying the only... It's, it's a high likelihood that a change will come only if Grayson Allen is slipping. Yeah, I, I think he's already slipped. But I, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Even more. Or continue yes. to be like this. A continued trend. Yeah, so he needs... Phrasing. Essentially, it all boils down to Grayson needs to figure some stuff out. He, if he maintains, like, normal Grayson, he's not losing that spot. Normal first half of the year, Grayson. Yes. Because the last, like, 20 games have not been good. Yeah, but if he get if he can regain that level, he is absolutely not losing his spot, no matter how well Wes and Dante are playing. I agree. I will stand by. No, I agree with that. Like I, you could argue like Wes and Dante could be better than him, even if it's just what we saw from Grayson Allen earlier, and that's fine. I'll concede that, but I still think that Grayson will hold on to that starting spot. Closing is an entirely different discussion. We just talked about that. There's a whole myriad of possibilities of who can be closing games. And we're seeing right now that it's probably matchup dependent. But starting, I think Grace, it's Grayson's to lose. I agree. Here is, here's the numbers. Just so, I, super late. But October Grayson, 13.7 points, uh, 4.4 rebounds, 1.4 assists, on 40 from the field, 37% from three. And this is only seven games. It's October. November, peak Grayson, 14 games. 13.9 points per game, uh, three and a half rebounds, again, 1.4 assists in a little less minute, like slightly less than one less minute per game. Shoots 47% from the field, 45% from deep, also 90% from free throw. In 11 December games, I don't think this includes this last game, which is not helping, 9.8 points per game. 2.9 rebounds, 0.9 assists, so all three numbers lower, despite playing slightly more than he played per game in November, shooting 37.9% from the field, 35% from three. Again, these numbers are actually a little lower than they're going to be. This is b-ball ref, so I don't have the Tuesday Orlando game, but most of them dropping because, again, not an overall good game from Grayson Allen. It's been a bad month. So we'll see if January in the new year, if he can turn it around. Yeah. He also had that weird injury slash illness. Yeah. Slash he sat whatever. for a while. He came off the bench for one game. It was, that's a good point. It was, uh, it was an odd time as well for, yeah. for Grayson. It's just been a weird month in the NBA. Yeah. December has. Yeah. I mean, maybe seen... Grayson's just, you know what? Maybe Grayson's just, he's just not feeling that great. You know? Could be. It's uh, the NBA has set a new record for number of total players to appear. Five hundred and forty-one, right? Greg Monroe. Yeah, Greg Monroe. Who was like a, a near double double? I want to take a victory lap. He would have been good. I'm fine with Boogie. I think Greg Monroe is just Boogie at home, but would have been good. He looks good. He does look good. Plus, it would have been fun to just get Greg Monroe back. Moose. Just screaming and what? <laughs> <laughs> so good. I would have cried at the first and one scream. So he literally, it was the most, a number of players who had ever played in a season before and won when Greg Monroe played. Is just, that not it's poetic? Just perfect. How do it's you not perfect. get emotional about basketball? I don't know. Basketball is a love story. That was good. Yep. That was deep. I, I, don't I feel like I didn't come got. up with that. Maybe. I heard it somewhere, but I don't have credit, so I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, that feels bad. I feel bad. Whoever came up with that, I'm sorry. I feel if, like it was a book, was it not? Did. I gotta look it up now. Right now? Yeah. We're at the end of the pod, Ty. Come on. 
It, it might not even be a quote. It doesn't sound that. Honestly, I ripped mine. I stole mine from Basketball Money. Love Story is a 2018 sports documentary film uh, from ESPN Films. So shout out to ESPN. There you go. There's credit. Shout out to Moneyball. That's where, how can you not get romantic about baseball is from Moneyball. Oh, I've never Billy seen it. Billy Bean says that in Moneyball. It's a good movie, actually. Okay, I might have to check that out. I have some time for the first time in a while, so that'll yeah. be good. Um, yeah, I think I already said it. I think we've reached the end of this podcast. Um, yeah, right? Do we have anything else to talk about for this team? We kind of went on a, we started with a year in review. We sort of went on a tangent about how this Bucks team is a dynasty in the making. Maybe. Uh, maybe, potentially. We're showing the right signs. People get very upset if you throw around the D word too early. Dynasty. Okay. Dynasty. The D word <laughs> is dynasty, and they're showing the right signs. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, like they, <laughs> I'm just gonna... Roy, they're showing the right signs of the D word. Yep, know, we're gonna. St- we're gonna. St- I don't. Let's. Yeah, we're done. Uh, thank you for listening to this episode of the Eurostep here on the Eurostep Podcast Network and the Blue Wire Podcast Network. If you did enjoy the show, like I mentioned up top, leave a five star rating on both Spotify and Apple. And if you leave a five star review on Apple, we'll read it out for you. Ty, do we have one to read out? We do. We we surpassed two hundred, which was our. Hey, goal thanks career. everyone. Thank we you everyone. Thank you all so much. I've been I've been jonesing to read this one. That's why I was trying to rush you through because Packers fan 03 says buckets exclamation point on his five star review. This is why I was excited to read it. Quote This pod is a must, all caps, listen for any Bucks fan. The best Bucks content you can get. This next sentence doesn't make a ton of sense, but I, I support it. He said they say all the hosts are rock solid. I can't pick a favorite. But then in parentheses, mine is tie. <laughs> uh, Pat to the rafters, exclamation point. So that's a great way to end it. Appreciate that. You did uh, pick a good favorite. Job. I don't thank, understand. Thank you. Thank you for the review, Ty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for make, making some more accounts yeah, here. Yeah. Um, Cooking the books. <laughs> No, but uh, seriously, thank you. Thank you for leaving that review. I know it wasn't you, Ty. Um, if you if you want to pick, apparently I'm polarizing, uh, according yeah. to a previous review. Well, and I am, uh, uh, I'm off and on. So I, this, this uh, <laughs> Packers fan 03 has mo- must have only seen the on episodes. Oh, there we go. Hey, in my, my uh, lens, all of them are on pods. Period. Appreciate that. Yeah. No problem. But uh, yeah, the way you can get these read, leaving a five-star rating on Apple. Unfortunately, Spotify doesn't have a re- review you know system what, yet. You know what? What? Let's, let's just make one. Let's just do it. If you leave a five-star, if you have always wanted a review read and said, I can't because I don't have Apple. If you have Spotify, you leave a five-star rating, which you can do on the app now, screenshot that and send that with an email to EurosteppPod at gmail.com and t- type something you want read. We'll, we'll start reading those two. We, we don't want to favor Apple too much. So we will read your Spotify review, which doesn't exist on Spotify, but it exists in GSPN. Just, you know, obviously it can't be too long or whatever, but some of the Apple ones got pretty long and that was fine. So, but yeah, that'll be good. So I like it. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. There you go. We're innovating here. Yeah. We're creating a review system Get for it Spotify. Together, Spotify. Yeah. We'll do I mean, they just, you, I guess. They just released the rating system in 2021. Tough. We're piling them up, by the way. We are. We're and whoever, whoever, whoever didn't leave a five star review, you Fix still it. haven't changed it. Fix it. Yeah. Uh, Adam had some choice words for you on the last episode. He went in. Not going to repeat them. No. But, uh, yeah, you don't you don't want it. You don't want it. So make sure you go change it. But I will but yeah. say, I will say though, to not end that part on a negative. The rest of our tremendous listeners oh, yeah, it's rushed been incredible. in and we were at like four seven or whatever. We're four nine now. We're the highest decimal besides a straight up five you can be. I'm not, I'm not losing sleep anymore. I, I feel like the rest of the community picked up the slack and I appreciate that. Yeah, no, the, the Eurostep community is absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Like we mentioned up top, thank you everyone for a tremendous year. 
Thank you for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe on your podcast platform of choice, Substack, gspn.substack.com, YouTube, Eurostep Podcast Network on YouTube. Uh, thank you guys. Hope you have a happy new year, however you celebrate. And uh, go Bucks. We'll talk to you next time.